Welcome to Mail Time, Suresh Venkat. Now, if there's one thing we have learnt over the course of our conversations on Mail TV, it is that one simply cannot stop learning. And so, we are here today to learn from one of India's finest marketing minds, Harit Nagpal. Currently the CEO of Tata Play, Harit has had a storied 40 plus year career that has also included stints with Lakme, Marico, Pepsi, Shopper Stop and Hutch Vodafone. All that learning has been distilled down into a book, Adapt, to thrive, not just to survive. Here, Harit investigates the idea of adaptation, the one thing every business needs to do to evolve. So let's dive deeper into strategies to help you build both brands and businesses as we get ready to melt with Harit Nagpal. Harit Nagpal, welcome to Melt. So you have your new book out. It's called Adapt. And I've just read through the book and I see a curious thing about the structure. Ten chapters, a hundred questions. And in the very first uh, introduction, you talk about your generation and I assume we are the same generation. <laughs> your ability to adapt to a rapidly changing world. Yeah. To what do you attribute this ability specifically to your generation to? The need to and the ability to look around as well as introspect. Both. Because our generation did not grow up with mobile phones. Uh, when we travelled in a bus, we looked outside the window, looked, observed people, observed things, observed changes in those things. We learned to adapt quite early, even though the scale of changes and the frequency of changes was much smaller than what it is today. But we learned to adapt ourselves to changes and that's how we survived. Whether it was the internet that came after we were born or started working or emails or search engines or whatever, we adapted to it. Isn't that fundamental human nature? In fact, in the very next chapter, or within the same chapter, you say that employees have not changed much despite all this fuss about marketers calling them Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen Alpha. You're saying people are the same. People are the same. What motivates, what motivated them 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago is what motivates them even now. So you don't buy into this whole theory of marketing to millennials or marketing to Gen Z because you're also the CEO of a, of a large company yourself. Yeah, but the, I, I, I look at my customers and you know, they are the same. Their needs are the same. Their needs are very, very, very basic and primal. They've just been accentuated by the changing technology around them and the ability of the technology to fulfill their needs. But the basic need is to be entertained, be informed, be educated, stay up to date. Like I said, you have 10 chapters in your book. Now I have 10 questions for you. Let's sure. say one question per chapter. Hmm. Your book has uh, stories that are deeply rooted in various cultures from around the world, from Dhaka to Jamaica, and there's one story that's from Europa, the moon of Jupiter. What's your thinking behind these unique settings for the stories? You know, I've been in six industries over a span of 40 years. And every new industry I went to, they said, oh, this industry is unique. What happens in other places doesn't happen here or what happens here doesn't happen elsewhere. You can't understand us. It's like, yeah. And that's something that I could never follow because I said, guys, your customer is the same guy who buys a cola, a candy, a cement, an airline ticket and life insurance and opens a bank account. And he uses a set of criteria which can't be very different across these categories. So how is your in industry unique? Or they would say, oh, Germans are different from Italians and Italians are different from Bangladeshis. We are all human. So stupidity and genius. Uh, are universal human traits. Human okay. traits. All right. <laughs> They're not limited to one industry or one country. So that's the point I was trying to prove through this. All right. Next question. One of the uh, chapters in your book talks about customer segmentation, the one that's set in Dhaka. In your view, Harit, what is wrong with the way customer segmentation is done today by many marketers? Most of the time, we decide which segment we want to go to. We decide what their problems We are. should sell to millennials or we should sell to Gen Z or exactly we should sell right. to SECB. Is every millennial or every Gen Z the same? Is he located within your reach? Do you have access to him? Do you have communication and product access to him? Within the margins that the product is providing you. Mm -hmm. Very often we end up launching and I've done that. I've made those mistakes many a times. Mm -hmm. Where we've fallen so much in love with the product that we have and we've already decided who it's going to go to and who will be the right buyer for it. And then we go and launch it. And then after launching, we realize there is the means of communication means of reaching him are so expensive that it wipes out my entire margin. Or the distribution chain that goes to him is, is very far away or very scattered so that I have to give two pieces here and two pieces here and two pieces there. 
or their buying frequency is so infrequent. It's not, it's not worth your while perhaps to sell. So that every time I have to sell to him, I have to advertise. Yeah. The discovery of the need of the customer and the discovery of the segment to whom it is meant for and is that segment accessible for communication as well as for distribution needs to be done independently, not with a bias, but with an open mind. Harit, continuing about the customer now, you also talk about turning customers into subscribers. Yeah. I have two questions on this. One, you run a company that is literally a subscription company. Mm. So not that difficult for you, but for an FMCG company, how are they going to do it? I don't think it is easy for us either because we run a prepaid system where he's not given me standing, standing instructions. When the money runs out on the balance on his television subscription or his OTT subscription, he has the option of not putting in more money if he's been not been happy in the last. Mm -hmm. uh, he can cancel his subscription and people do. So I can't say that once I've got a subscriber, he's with me for the rest of his life or my life or our lives. Okay. So I also have customers who I call subscribers. Okay. So similarly, if I don't have, if I'm an F, and I've, I've spent half my life in FMCG and half my life here, so therefore, we never thought of our customers as subscribers. That once he's bought one brand, the next time he's got a brand buying opportunity, he's going to buy me or he's going to try somebody else. How many modifications does an FMCG brand make in its product, packaging, delivery mechanism, uh, communication, uh, etc. versus how many modifications a service brand makes. I think a physical product makes less modifications in its product and delivery mechanism than a service brand. We do it all the time. I mean, I was in telecom earlier and now in television. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of modifications we make in the user interface in the programming, in the delivery mechanisms, in the… So, it's a constant work in it's progress. It's a constant work, work in progress. progress. Every day is a new day and there is some change or the other happening all the time here. And you have the ability to do that in a service business well, like you Well, I think say. the ability to do that is all in our heads. Okay. You can also do that in the physical… Today, technology exists in making more frequent changes in the product and the delivery mechanism uh, than we had probably 30 years ago. So, it's it's all in our head saying, this is a virtually delivered product, that's a physically delivered product, I can't change it as frequently. If we set about doing it, we can. Harit, many of the protagonists in your book, the one thing I noticed about them is they're all fundamentally nice people trying to do the right thing always. They're all CEOs and leaders in their own ways. The reality is many leaders are not like them. I've worked under many leaders myself. Uh, I'm going to use the word profit-making jerks. Mm. Right? They're jerks, but they're very profitable to the company and they've been rewarded for bad behavior over and over again. They've risen to a position of leadership. Their motivation, maybe money and maybe something else, not necessarily what's good for the customer or even what's good for the business at large. How do you deal with that? When I started, there were more profit-making jerks in the industry than they are today. Yeah. And their number is reducing dramatically because the industry was not as hyper-competitive in the past as it is today. So, a profit making jerk as you call him or her uh, is not likely to get as long a rope anymore in the modern anymore in the hyper competitive situation today. Either customers will leave him okay. if he short changes them or his colleagues will leave him if he's not if he doesn't alter his behavior. Any reason why you haven't referred to any single one of these kind of bosses in your book? I'm seeing less and less of them. And when you're writing a book, I think you need to set standards. Of what, not that's a good point. Of what to do. <laughs> okay. All right. Another issue that I'm going to bring about in one of the chapters that you bring about is greenwashing and virtue signaling. Many companies use ESG or organic or eco-friendly simply to greenwash their brands. And customers are lapping it up. What does this say to a marketer? There is a reference in one of the stories where they did try out a product which was… The bamboo dance, bamboo, uh, specific example. Bamboo, tissue papers, yeah. etc. And then they discover when they go to the market that the customer is willing to buy them provided it is the same price as Correct. a non-greenwashed product. Correct. And in this case, the product actually may be green since it's made of bamboo. Bamboo. But the processing at least or if it is positioned as a mm -hmm. natural product or whatever, uh, they were willing to indulge in it, but they're not willing to pay a premium for it. Okay. 
uh, that's that's been the kind of uh, so if you if you're able to produce uh, environment friendly product which is not hugely expensive versus a non environmentally product you have chances of success what does that tell a marketer about the future of what say the next generation wants or what they're willing to pay a premium for from electric vehicles to uh, not buying fast fashion what does this mean in I terms think, of i mean anybody who's buying an environmentally fr- uh, friendly product is also looking at a benefit for example if you're buying an electric vehicle you're not buying because you want to sa- save the world from fumes you most of the time you're buying it because instead of 10 rupees a kilometer you're spending 70 paisa a kilometer are you saying that as as customers we are all just not to be too harsh but we're cynically self serving we don't really care well, about well as long as i'm not paying extra for the environment i'm fine and i think the it. marketers attempt also needs to be to provide an environmentally friend, environmentally friendly product within the same price but organic food for instance cannot be the same price as regular food it it, it cannot be and it will not be and therefore the size of that market around us may be 40% share the but bandra west the whole, market in, in is, the whole scheme of things it's not 40% I'm going to another chapter in your book where you talk about innovation versus maintenance. Now innovation is both flashy and exciting but maintenance from highways to products to companies to user interfaces sound like boring activities. How do you keep uh, your maintenance division motivated to do to do well to do the right thing to stay on top of their game? Well, both need to have a purpose. The customer if you ask me is looking for certainty and possibility in two words. certainty of getting what i got last time and possibility of getting something better you can't substitute one for the other so there's some of us whose job it is to ensure that what a customer got last time he at least gets that much and in the process if i can give him a little bit more uh, that'll be a delight okay so maintenance is the starting point that what i gave you last time i will definitely give you that much The guys who work on innovation will hog all the credit and the awards and everything. I don't else. think there are separate guys for innovation and separate guys for maintenance. There is no. Okay. That's one framework to have not yeah. have. It to. is. It is the same guys who work for maintenance, make, ensuring the what they get. Mm-hmm. Their delight is to be able to deliver something more. Mm-hmm. You can't have. Okay, these guys will do innovation. These guys will do maintenance. No, it's. What is the challenge for the maintenance guy then? If he's not. if his vision if his game his 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 role is not raised to deliver a little more when you go to buy a product companies will woo you and woo you to say this and that and buy this the day you call customer service you'll be put on hold for 11 minutes or worse still you'll reach them on social media and you'll get boilerplate response saying thank you very much for your feedback we'll look into this and get back to you as soon as we can customers as you know you are a customer yourself when when we are a customer we want customized service we want the ceo to pick up the phone and say yes sir i will get on the job right away for a 3 rupee product yes yes correct <laughs> we want it as customers right and sometimes it's a 3 rupee product and sometimes a 20 lakh car companies tend to see do they see customer service as this onerous burden that they have to sort of grit your teeth and say okay no, we have to do I it think so it's an opportunity it? because like i said if i have to make a subscriber out of you you need to there's a credo we follow here there's eight points that we have here subscribers subscribe to us to watch tv and not to speak with us correct so don't give them a chance to speak with us that correct. means your failure rates need to be zero your misunderstandings need to be zero what you know is what it is i cannot tell you more than what it is i cannot tell you less than what it is that's the first part if i have a problem i should know who i am supposed to get in touch with mm-hmm. i should be able to get in touch with that person in the first try I should be able if I the moment I get in touch with that person I should be able to tell him my problem in one go and he should understand in that go itself right. he should be able to give me a solution on the contact itself if he cannot he should give me a fixed turnaround time in which he will get back to me which cannot be very long and if he realizes after the contact is over that he cannot come back to you within the turnaround time then he should get back to me before the turnaround time is over and say i'm sorry and say i'm sorry i need an extension and this is something we've been following forever that's okay. our charter everybody in the company knows about it okay if you follow this and then convert it into metrics which are measurable on each of these counts mm-hmm. 
things work. Does it need CEO level commitment to push? One hundred percent. Customer service is not something that will be run by the uh, customer, customer service, service function head. because invariably the problems that customer service function solves are created by other functions. Correct. They are your cleaning department. I, I'm sure a lot of your friends are your subscribers as well. They're going to call you and say, Harith, I want you to solve this for me. Uh, I get it all the time. What does that say? We like talking to a person in charge who's a human being who'll say, don't worry. And it's a welcome thing because at I'll least I get to know which process of mine is not working. You don't see it as a burden on your time. Oh, like no, this. not at all. Because, you know, over a month or so, you know which are the kind of complaints that are coming more often. Mm -hmm. so therefore, these processes are not working. So you get back into those processes and say, why did three people have to call me for this particular problem this month? Uh, three is enough for me because last month three people did not call me for so this you have problem. A pattern from those three. Uh, that pattern uh, you recognize in your head. In your head you recognize that pattern. And if that pat if you've got three people calling you for the same problem this month, that means that process is not working. Harit, I'm moving on to another chapter in your book, and this I call the enduring seductive appeal of the 30-second PVC. I, I've been in multiple meetings when the business or the strategy or the service needs to be completely redesigned, and for obvious reasons. And the market says, no, I just contacted the agency, we'll get a new TVC made. In your view, what is this appeal of this, enduring appeal of this 30-second TVC? And now it's become three-minute TVCs, by the way, online. They're not 30 seconds yeah, anymore. Self-indulgent marketers are Self-indulgent making... marketer does not even uh, remember that the there is a customer at the end of it who may not have three minutes to watch. Uh, who wants to watch a three-minute <laughs> long ad for a biscuit? I mean, I don't want to. True, true. No, I think the point that I was trying to make in this is that we've moved from a tell mode to a sell mode. If you and I meet, we don't start conversing business right in the first Correct. go. We, we talk about the weather, the journey. What's uh, happening in the world. What's happening gossip, in the world. Gossip, gossip, all of that. Yeah. Uh, what do you have? Coffee or whatever. Is the coffee good here? Uh, you know, and how's the family and things like those. Yeah. If I start coming to the point of business right away, I don't think you will transact with me. Yeah. And that's what we moved on to over a period. We start selling in the first introduction. Mm -hmm. Almost every communication of ours to the customer is about my price, my features, my product. Buy me, buy me, buy it me. It is not engaging here. I mean, the good old har ghar kuch kehta hai. Correct. Where are they? How many har ghar kuch kehta hai? I mean, there's just one example I'm doing. There used to be many at that time. How many of those har ghar kuch kehta hai? which were trying to build a contact with the person, per not talking about the shades I have and not talking about the price I'm available at and not talking about the number of shops I'm available at and uh, Diwali here, I'm giving you a discount. We and didn't talk about that. I mean, there is a role for that kind of communication. There is a role, but, but first you have to establish contact. First, yeah. the people have to like you, then they buy from you. They don't buy from you if, if they don't like you. This sounds you like basic MBA marketing 101, Harit. Why are so many marketers not getting this in your view? And agencies perhaps. I think attention spans and short termism is the only answer I may have for it. Okay. There are some good brands that are out there. There which are, are a few it. always. Who are there are a few it. always, but the numbers have reduced. Okay. So my attempt in this chapter essentially was uh, bringing back that, trying to bring back that ability to connect with the customer. But you also make a larger point. When you talk about the bank, I think in Ghana, that the service design of the bank has to be designed to cater to once you advertise and you get inquiries, you can't get uh, See, flummoxed in, after in that. The purpose of advertising is to, uh, you know, highlight the substantiators that you built in. If you got a hollow product. But you got to build those uh, differentiators. Because great product. advertising can only sink a bad product faster. Yeah. We all know that. So, you don't have a product, but you have great advertising. The customer, you, many people will get to know that you have nothing faster. So, you first need to build the features unfailing, and differentiated. And the marketer says, I'm sorry, uh, supply chain is not my problem. How do you beat this kind of siloization? Which is, which is why you need to work in collaboration. You can't be working in, Market let me create the advertising, is the sales guy who failed. Harith, you've devoted one full chapter in your book to uh, PowerPoint presentations. I can see a lot of personal angst must have also come out having sat through hundreds of meaningless PowerPoint presentations. Do you think PowerPoint should be banned in the workplace? Absolutely, yes. I, I, I strongly believe in that. Two ways. Somebody walks into my office and wants to have a meeting with me. And then the moment his hand goes towards his bag to take out sinks. his laptop, my heart sinks as there go 15 minutes of meaningless yeah, yeah. banter. Yeah. So my normally my reaction to him is, can we talk about it? Yeah. If you can't explain it to me face to face, looking at me in the eye, then no amount of PowerPoints are going to. But this chapter was about reviews. 
what really happened in the happens in most meetings is tomorrow is a, three days later is a meeting say in your office where some people are su supposed to review the previous month or the previous week or previous quarter or whatever the entire team for the next four or five days is sitting down beautifying dressing up data dressing hmm. up data yeah. and writing lines in english uh, and remodifying them to make a meaning or get some meaning out of data that's there. Mm -hmm. What if I was to just see the Excel sheets? And you make sense of it yourself. A, I'll be able to see, uh, connect the dots and see the trends. And B, it gives you a chance of playing with them and extrapolating. Let us find the meaning collectively in that meeting from Excel sheets. Rather than looking at the dress up, it saves people the time to dress up data to find uh, fancy English idioms for uh, some idiotic data somewhere. And we have a sleeves rolled up kind of a meeting. And worst of all, embedded videos in PowerPoint that will never play. They'll never play, play in the first try play. ever. And some <laughs> techie is going to hit the button 50 times. All right. Harit, from a, a reading of your book, it seems to me that you're quite the flair for storytelling yourself. Any chance that a fiction book is in the cards after this one? Well, this is fiction enough. I was, I actually... Well, I mean, narrative fiction, a story for maybe for... No, I haven't. I mean, it, it, I, of short I, I, need to have a, I need to have a basic experience for that. So, you know... Well, you've gone from Ghana to Europa in this yeah, book. Yeah, but, you know, the experience that I was... The, 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 the content the, uh, that was there uh, was real-life content on which I built the story. Oh. So, uh, if I get kidnapped tomorrow... <laughs> Okay. Or something like that. Then maybe I'll. We're write hoping that won't happen. But no, yeah, okay. But, yeah. <laughs> but that could lead to a good. That could lead to a book. <laughs> All right. For people with low attention spans, Harit, if I were to summarize his entire book into ten words, what would those ten words be? Customer, customer, and let's repeat it ten times. All right. Just repeat the word customer ten times. Ten times. That's an excellent summary of the book. Adapt, Harit. Congratulations on your book. Thank you for talking to us on Merit. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me over. Thanks. And that's a wrap on this episode. You can follow Melt on social media. The handle is ready to melt or simply log on to readytomelt.com. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Suvenk on X. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.